Trust is a pivotal part of the relationship. It is the foundation that helps us to feel safe, that enables us to share vulnerable feelings, to go through life experiences, and also just do the mundane things in life, uh, like knowing that the person we trust will do what we ask them to do, will show up for the date, will pay the bill, will help us when we need a lift and our car is broken. Sue Johnson, in her work, Emotionally Focused Therapy or EFT, it's different to tapping. This is uh, about attachment and attachment healing through emotionally focused therapy. Talks about how in attachment, what is very important is that when our partner reaches out a hand and they say, where are you? Like a little child, they are looking to us to find security, to find safety, for us to say, you are not in it alone. I am here, I am going to help you through this. And this is a sign that our vulnerability is then safe in the relationship. So when this is not here, when we call out our partner with simple things like running errands and we ask them to pick up the laundry or take out the rubbish or meet us somewhere and they continuously do not show up in those ways, it erodes trust. Now, when it comes to attachment styles, fearful avoidance are said to have the biggest trust wounds and that is 100% correct. But in this video, I'm going to talk about all of the attachment styles and their trust wounds. So, a securely attached individual learns that they can trust their parents and their environment because their needs are met. This means that the baby or the child cries or calls for the parent and the parent is there. So, maybe the child is or the infant is small and it's in the crib and it cries out. The parent goes to the infant and wants to figure out what does the infant want. Do they want a nappy change? Do they want food? Do they want to be held? And then the needs are met. If those needs are met, apparently somewhere roughly around 37%, the child then learns that I can trust that when I am vulnerable, when I express my needs, that somebody in the environment is going to help me. And this goes the same thing for when the child grows up a little bit and is on the playground. And you know how kids look back to their parents and they just see like, okay, mom or dad is there, so I'm gonna go and play. And when, and if I need to, I will call for them and they will come. So if they fall off the slide or if another child is mean to them, they can call for mommy or daddy and somebody is there that fosters a sense of safety and that builds trust in connection. And it also helps us to understand that when I'm vulnerable, I can just ask for help from somebody around me. This makes world a much safer place to be in. So I can be confident that whatever I cannot handle by myself in life, I can just ask from the friends in my support group. So this is secure functioning. This is why secure people don't have issues with asking for help, like dismissive avoidance, fearful avoidance, and even anxious preoccupied in certain circumstances. So let's look at how the other attachment styles have trust issues. Let's start first with the dismissive avoidant. How they trust shows up is that they do not trust another person with their vulnerability. In their past, whenever they were vulnerable, somebody either neglected their needs or shamed them or rejected their needs. This could have looked like Johnny coming home from school and telling the mom or the dad or whoever was present there, the caretaker, that the other boys were nasty to him. And the parent could have just gone, oh, this is just school, get over it, you'll be fine. This is neglect. The child didn't get seen, didn't feel heard, 
and it didn't feel like there was a connection. So in this case, there was no trust built. If this happens over time, like it did with dismissive avoidance, then the child creates this belief system that, well, there is no point in going to the people around me. I just have to handle everything by myself because I'm either going to be neglected or ridiculed. So another situation could have been that same boy comes in and says, the kids were nasty to me and whoever's there. Sometimes it's even the older sibling that can have this effect on the child and the older sibling can go like, oh, you're such a wimp, no wonder everybody's mean to you and bully the child even more. And then the child learns that my vulnerability is not safe. So I better hold it all in and figure it out by myself because when I bring it to other people, it gets hurt even more. So when dismissive avoidance grow up, in their relationships, what you will find is that they will not ask for help and they will not ask for their needs to be met because they have suppressed most of their needs or they're not aware that they have needs and it doesn't feel good for them to express feelings. It's very alien to them because that is associated with something negative in their past. So this is not a thought process necessarily that they are aware of, especially if it was formed very early on in childhood. It is just a thing that they do, just like breathing, just like eating, just like a liver function, right? When something becomes so ingrained and automatic, we don't think about breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. It simply becomes a part of our autonomic nervous system, which is just what makes us run. And this is why it's so difficult also to change these patterns. And in coaching, how we change them is through rewiring the nervous system, rewiring the soma. A lot of these wounds also happen pre verbal stages. So before the child starts talking, they have these experiences in the, um, as an infant and that might then cause them to shut down from a very, very early age and they don't even know that they are doing it. It's just a part of their makeup. And this is why a lot of dismissive avoidance also fear that they cannot change. And this is what often stops them from going to therapy or coaching on working on themselves is because they have this deep shame and deep fear that even if I work on myself, I will not be able to change this. Okay, so this forms a part of that inadequacy and then the um, um, I'm not good enough and also the inadequacy core wound and there is something very, very deeply wrong with me. All right, so I am defective. That is the wound that I was actually looking for. I am defective. So that is dismissive avoidance. So in relationship, how to heal this is through first learning their own emotions and needs how we have negative emotions and how those negative emotions lead to needs and then allowing others into the space of fulfilling my needs with me. So say for example, of course I can do a lot of things by myself, okay? I'm an independent woman, but it's nice for my boyfriend to make me a cup of tea. It is nice for somebody to help me with the groceries or do something that I could of course do, but it would be nice for somebody else to do it for me, maybe run me a bath. So once the dismissive avoidant learns to ask for their needs to be met, maybe closeness, maybe space, maybe um, a nice meal to be cooked for them, then they start to allow somebody else in. So if your dismissive avoidant person, whether that is your partner or somebody else in your life, does that with you, that means that they trust you, okay? This is very precious. So acknowledge that and actually tell them because they love that you acknowledge this um, thing that goes on for them, that they see that it is difficult for them to trust and that they are trying to trust you and opening up to you. 
for everybody else it might seem quite normal that you ask a, a little favors but for dismissive avoidance and fearful avoidance they do not like to ask for favors they would rather burn out <laughs> um, or I don't know like get burnt on the stake than ask for help so if they ask you for help this means that they trust you all right so moving from the dismissive avoidant to the fearful avoidant so fearful avoidance unfortunately have been betrayed throughout their lives in many different forms and this is uh, due to the trauma whenever we have trauma it feels also like betrayal because if there is trauma in the family that we've grown up with we have these unwritten uh, or unspoken contracts like you are my dad or my mom or my caretaker or my sibling and you are supposed to keep me safe you are supposed to do what you say you are supposed to make sure that i am okay and if that doesn't happen, if there is abuse or there is neglect or there is a lot of inconsistency that creates feelings of fear, then the person, the child also feels like my trust has been broken. I cannot be in environments where I'm vulnerable because my vulnerability leads me to be unsafe. And of course, situations like with the dismissive avoidance, that can also happen where there was bullying through their parents' abuse or perhaps a sibling or at school. So all of those could also come up. Of course, um, abandonment can also add to this trauma. And in the past, they might have also chosen partners that was similar to their parents because their parents um, or our parents create this pattern of what is normal in our life, our belief system. So when we choose our partners, we usually choose people who are familiar to us, to our subconscious mind. And this is why we often date people who are very similar to either the mom or the dad or whoever was there that was bringing us up um, in those early days. So they end up making the same choices until they start doing this work. For fearful avoidance, it is a huge, huge pain point trust they are people who seek honesty if they sense that you're not genuine in any type or form um, whether your laugh is not genuine the way you look is not genuine i know when i was a fearful avoidant and i just started teaching yoga i was so in search of the truth and i was such a seeker of the truth that you know if a yoga teacher had makeup on i would be like oh they are not authentic <laughs> Now I look back at that and I really laugh because I understand that's got nothing to do with authenticity and that's what was authentic to that person. So, uh, but of course these fears for the fearful avoidant can be quite big and they can deactivate in violent ways. Their suspicion can take over. Sometimes they will keep that to themselves and sometimes it will actually make them leave relationships or question their partners or violate your, the person, the, the, the partner's boundaries by snooping around. And that is really painful. Um, you know, it's also difficult to heal that in the relationship itself without the subconscious mind reprogramming and repatterning. I've seen this before. I know from my own experience as a fearful avoidant who is trying to heal trust wounds. It's not just as easy as talking to your partner about it. Really, that rewiring of your brain has to happen, especially if there was something like narcissistic abuse in the past uh, that many fearful avoidants have experienced. We have to change the belief system and how the body reacts from that very automatic, autonomic nervous system where it's just there is no space for thinking, it just acts the same as your spleen. Right? You don't think about it. So we have, when we change those deep core, core beliefs, 
through rewiring. So reprogramming is very similar to what Joe Dispenza does, what Bruce Lipton talks about. They often tell you about it, but they don't tell you how to do it. Yes, it is about finding a different experience in thought. So like saying an affirmation like, I am, it is safe to trust or I trust. And then finding the experience and also the evidence in your current environment or past environment so that you can rewire your brain. Okay, it's a, it's a process that we wanna feel into. It sounds very easy and simple, but a lot of people struggle with this. So I usually like to take them through coaching with that. We do coaching for 21 to 30 days on a core wound and we see incredible results. People shift not only their belief systems, but what comes from our belief systems is our action, is our thinking and our feeling and we select something different in our environment. So when we start to trust, and when we heal the trust wound, we will not be a resonance to connect with other people in our environment who are not trustworthy. Or we can spot those red flags so much quicker. I know I used to miss red flags regularly. Like, how could I not see that? Like, you know, now I know that if I'm going to date a DJ, like, what do you expect? <laughs> this person is most probably higher values freedom, they like novelty, they like uh, other girls. Of course, this is stereotypical and not all DJs are like that. But yes, if I have to put people in the group, generally that type of individual might be more, more prone to have affairs than somebody that is, I don't know, a computer nerd, right? I'm not saying computer people, like I studied uh, programming as well. So, as a, as a, so when I say nerd, I, I mean it in like the, the best and most respectful ways. I have the biggest love for people who, who do programming and all tech stuff. Um, but yes, there are these divisions, right? And we miss obvious red flags because we have these core wounds and we let our wounds pick instead of picking from our heart and from something that is more wholesome and healed within us. All right, so my anxious, preoccupied friends, they have been hurt through abandonment, whether that was perceived abandonment, that, you know, a parent went away to work and, or they went, or your, the parents uh, left I don't know, for a gala or a holiday and they left the kids at home and then the kids felt abandoned. Or well, there was actual abandonment. Maybe there was a divorce. Maybe there was just inconsistency where the child would reach out to the parent and the parent was not there. Maybe they were depressed. Maybe they were avoidant. Something happened that they were not there for the child. So the child learns that when I reach out for you, you're sometimes there and you're sometimes not there, which makes me not trust that you will be there for me all the time. And that is anxiety provoking. In a study where they put rice, <laughs> mice, not rice, mice in a little playpen and they wanted to taste uh, addiction, right? So. The, the, this little playpen, little mice used to run or rats ran around and they just went on their normal business. And when they wanted to eat, they had like this little dispenser, they would go there and they would get a pallet of food. So when this supply of pellets was consistent, then the rats were chilled. They would groom, they would play, they would come and eat, they would go away. And then the scientists thought, okay, let's randomize this. Sometimes the pellet is gonna come out, sometimes it's not going to come out. What's gonna happen? What they found is that the right, the, why do I keep saying rice, mice? <laughs> the mice went to the dispenser and they were so preoccupied. They just kept pressing the button, kept pressing the button. And this is what also happens with gamblers. It's this inconsistent reassurance. It's like it drives us absolutely crazy, forms 
uh, addictive patterns. All right, and that's why anxious, preoccupied individuals, like I don't really trust that you're gonna be here. I don't trust that you, that you really like me, that you're not going to abandon me because I didn't have this experience in childhood. So they will need to have that experience over and over and over and over. And I would also suggest just rewiring this core wound so that they can feel safe in the trust. They can feel pacified. They can find that consistency because, you know, they can often, anxious, preoccupied individuals can often sabotage their relationships. And it's such a pity because they are just such beautiful, loving individuals who just want to share love and be in love. And um, they, they are beautiful partners to be with as well. So this trust wound is really a big one, you know, and uh, it's very important to heal that. And there are ways in a fairly short period of time, you can heal this wound. If you start reprogramming, you will start to see results in the first seven days. I didn't believe this. And when I started doing it, I was completely shocked that I would act differently. The biggest, the biggest, biggest challenge that people come to me with or come to see psychologists and coaches is with their behavior that they cannot change, right? Like, why do I keep calling my partner or leaving them 20 missed calls or messaging them nonstop? I know this is not good for my relationship, but I get into this pattern, that's automatic pattern, right? That is coming from that childhood trauma or the dismissive avoidant will just go on to the other side completely and withdraw and not, not, not engage. And they don't know how do I change this? And behaviorists try to change that from, okay, change your behavior. If the wounds are very deep, it's gonna be extremely difficult to change that behavior. The wound is a limiting belief system that is in the subconscious mind, okay? It is something that is like, like I mentioned before, like breath, like liver function, spleen function, like your heart, right? So we wanna be able to affect that and we do that through changing the thought pattern changing the felt sense in the body, in the soma. So we reprogram somatically and therefore we reprogram the subconscious mind. Once that is reprogrammed, we have different thoughts. That's the mind blowing thing. You will start to notice that you'll think differently, you feel differently and you act differently naturally. A lot of people come to me and say, P, I cannot believe it. I all of a sudden, don't message my partner a million times a day. We are apart and I am calm, I feel so calm. Or when we work on other things like I am unworthy core wound, they come to me and they say, you know, I just naturally set boundaries. I can't believe that I naturally set a boundary because all of our actions at the root of it, we wanna to get to the belief system. And like Joe Dispenza says and Bruce Lipton, it doesn't just stop there. Not just through our, uh, not just at, at our actions. The benefits are also physical and physical and emotional health, and that's what I want from for everybody. Not from everybody for everybody. Uh, I want to I, I help people shift from surviving to thriving. That is a state in your nervous system where you're shifting out of just surviving, right? Just in like coping. I'm in my sympathetic nervous system. My gut is a mess. I've got tension in my body. I'm acting without thinking, I'm a bit dissociated, to thriving, which is a state where I feel safe, where I feel creative, where I feel alive, where I feel open to connection and I feel safe in that connection. And I feel trusting in myself, my own abilities and in the greater collective and perhaps in the, the bigger, um, whatever is bigger out there that you believe in. So my name is Patricia Mohotska and thank you so much for being here and listening all the way through to the end. Leave me a little comment if you did. Thank you for being on this channel and I will see you in the next one. Big love.